This is where that blurred line between effective law enforcement and corrupt practices, this is where it starts, isn't it? Why doesn't he fly over some suitable area and drop the heroin out of the aircraft at that location where Milligan and his two Confederates can travel cross country, go to the location, pick up the heroin, return to Sydney? All right in theory, not so great in practice. I'm Andrew Rule. this is Life and Crimes. This week we have a special guest on the podcast, John Shobrook. He's one of the more interesting people who have worked in law enforcement agencies in this country. As a young man, John worked for the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and as an agent worked mostly in Northern Australia on some very interesting cases. And today we're going to talk to him because he has, after something like a 40-year absence, decided to write a book which exposes many of the things that went wrong back in the late 70s and early 80s in the Queensland as run by the Bielke Peterson government. I've read John's book in a sitting and found it fascinating. Really, I'd boil it down to two things to talk about today. I think one is the ripping yarn of how crooks plotted to bring in a shipment of heroin in the late 70s in a light plane from New Guinea and drop it over the jungle in far north Queensland. That's the ripping yarn element. John worked on that story and he's going to tell us all about it. The second and probably most important part of the story is what happened next. And what happened next was that John Shobrook, an honest investigator, got caught up in the politics of corruption in Queensland in the late 70s. It's taken him 40 years to square the ledger and he's finally done it with this book which is called Operation Jungle. And that's why we're talking to the author today. John Shobrook, welcome to Life and Crimes. Thank you, Andrew. Now, ripping yarn first, I think you're going to tell us that in the late 70s, you met an interesting scoundrel and uh, take us away from there. Yes, the uh, scoundrel that you refer to was John Milligan. Yep. A um, very active criminal. He ran prostitutes. He was convicted of a break and enter. Yep. But his major interest was in importing heroin into the country. Before the Operation Jungle heroin importation took place, he had successfully um, involved himself in several smaller importations. Right. A highly intelligent crook, do you think, and not, not so much a violent person as one who wanted to prove how smart he was? Yes, exactly. Uh, John had been a judge's associate in Queensland. Had he? I think you mentioned um, that. He, yeah. he wasn't. Uh, he certainly wasn't lacking in intelligence, and it was said that he had an IQ approaching genius level. What happened to the legal career? Yeah, something went wrong there. That was his first foray into criminal activity. He started stealing books from the court and selling them to law students. Had the fatal flaw. Yep. He wasn't a rough crim, that's for sure. What was his background, really? He was born in Corakai in near Lismore in New South Wales, northern New South Wales. He w- worked in a bank, good education, uh, went to attended Queensland University, working towards a law degree, and then he got the position as a judge's associate. Judge Seaman was the name of the judge yep. in Queensland, in Brisbane. But he seemed to like the thrill of knocking about with, shall we say, dangerous people. Yeah. He rubbed shoulders with several well-known Sydney criminals. Anyone in power he would keep who he met, he would keep a card file on. In Is case that right? One, yeah. He was well organised in case one day they could be of use to him. He'd ingratiate himself to them. He wasn't a heroin user himself. He appeared to be in it for the thrill of the chase and for matching his wits against the police's wits. Isn't that interesting? A sort of a vaguely sociopathic personality with a point to prove. Definitely. In fact, reminds me of a a crook who 
became well known in Victoria once uh, in around the same era, a fellow called David Macmillan, who ended up breaking out of the Bangkok Hilton, as they call the big jail in Bangkok, and getting away from, you know, a death sentence, essentially. Similar sort of bloke was the well-bred, well-educated, well-spoken, slightly built fellow who was desperate to show that he was smarter than all the others. So they seem to be a type, don't they? Milligan was, he was cunning. He would, um, as I said, ingratiate himself to police officers and then he would become an informant for them. Right. You know, he, he wasn't trying necessarily to lock up heroin importers. He was trying to lock up his opposition and the, the competitors in the field. He was used to the sort of police that didn't mind taking a few shortcuts and encouraging their own pet dealers ahead of others that they could arrest. Exactly. And I think this is an indication as to why John Milligan had been arrested several times on 90% of the occasions the cases weren't proceeded with. The charges were dropped or he didn't front court. Yep. And I think that was probably his uh, police handlers realising he was more valuable out on the streets providing information than locking him up and letting him rot away in jail somewhere. I see. And, of course, this is where that blurred line between effective law enforcement and corrupt practices, this is where it starts, isn't it, where you need informers and so you encourage some of them and let them get away with a few things in order for the greater good. And that's the thin edge of the wedge when it comes to getting involved with them and probably taking money from them and so on. Yes, indeed. Where did you actually meet Milligan and what happened? I met him uh, on the day that I arrested him in September 1979. But I'd been working on the Operation Jungle investigation for about 14 months prior to arresting him. The heroin that was involved in Operation Jungle had been successfully imported two years previously. Right. So this was really a cold case. When you got to it. And what did you you find out? As you mentioned, Andrew, the the story itself of the importation is incredible. How did they get this stuff into the country? They found a willing pilot and he borrowed a plane or something? It's a very chancy story. They didn't even have to hire an aircraft, pay for the cost of a light aircraft to go across New Guinea and back. Their pilot was the service manager for Sharp Electronics in Australia. Good Lord. And just liked adventure, did he? He did. He wasn't a heroin user either. Not short of money himself? No, well-spoken, nice chap. And Milligan, he he was looking for adventure in his life and Milligan could offer it to him. What was his name again? His name was Ian Barron. Ian Barron, so he's an executive in the company you mentioned, Sharp. Yes. Uh, He'd be a well-paid sort of fellow, and he just liked the rush of adrenaline, and he was quite a good amateur pilot. He used to socialise with John Milligan. In men-only clubs and so forth. Yep. One of Milligan's um, traits was he was an incredible raconteur. He would tell the most outrageous stories. Maybe some of them were true, maybe they weren't. But they were certainly exciting to listen to, and I think this is what sucked Barron, and he thought, wow, what adventure, I'd like to be a part of that. And Milligan finally put it to him, how would you like to fly a light aircraft up to New Guinea and back for us, and we'll cover all your expenses? You know, if that's not excitement, then I don't know what is. Where did he get the plane again? He looked in a magazine called the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association magazine. Virtually a trade magazine for people who own light aircraft. He found a suitable aircraft for sale in the magazine, suitable in that it had the range to get up to Port Moresby and back, and the right avionics. And it was a multi engine aircraft, twin engine. He, his license was endorsed for twin engine aircraft. So he went to the owner, flew up to Cairns, went and saw the chap who was selling the aircraft and said, I'm from Sharp Electronics, produced his business card. We're thinking of flying company executives up to New Guinea and back to set up an office in New Guinea. Of course, the the guy selling the aircraft thinks to himself, wow, this Sharp Electronics are going to have no trouble paying for an aircraft. So he said, look, take it for a test flight, no charge. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? Uh, And they did. And they did it again with the second aircraft. Twice they were given aircraft to take up to New Guinea and back. So he flies to New Guinea, this is in late 77? About mid-77, 
the first flight was to test whether they could do it. Um, oh, that's just a test flight. So he flies to Port Moresby. Flight. The original plan was for Barron to depart Cairns Airport on his own, but then he would land at Mount Carbine, a little on a deserted airstrip outside of the little township of Mount Carbine in Cape York Peninsula. There he would pick up one of Milligan's associates. In actual fact, he'd pick up the man who had already flown the heroin from Bangkok into Port Moresby and left it in a hotel room. The two of them, this was the plan, the two of them would then fly to Port Moresby, get hold of the heroin, return to Mount Carbine, where the associate of Milligan's, his name was Brian Parker, would get out of the aircraft with the heroin. Milligan would be waiting for him, drive back to Sydney, Baron would fly onto Cairns where customs could search the aircraft, they'd find nothing. So they did the dummy run just to prove that Parker could get out of the country and back in without being noticed. And it worked. It worked. But then Baron got cold feet about landing on this airstrip not that far from Mount Carbine. He thought, you know, someone might take down the registration number of the aircraft. So he suggested instead of them landing at Mount Carbine and returning to Mount Carbine, why doesn't he fly over some suitable area and drop the heroin out of the aircraft at that location where Milligan and his two Confederates can travel cross country, go to the location, pick up the heroin, return to Sydney. All right in theory, not so great in practice. These guys were from King's Cross. They didn't know what it was like up in Cape York. And here they are trying to get from the small town of Laura, population 70, to Princess Charlotte Bay, where the heroin was dropped. You say 70 people, but a lot more crocodiles out in the... Um... Exactly. Yeah. Snakes and crocodiles, sunburn, dengue fever. Yeah, the whole it, lot. It was hell. And on their first trip, they didn't get the heroin. Right, so you're saying that our friend Baron, the cold feet man, he flies over a t what a tabletop mountain, a flat topped yes. mountain, which is jungle, not open country, and he drops two parcels of heroin, like a kilo each or whatever they might be, wrapped up in tape and stuff. Yep. And then the idea is these the boys from King's Cross are going to drive up cross country through hundreds of kilometres of rough tracks and all the rest of it, R river crossings, swamp crossings, and then park a, their hired Toyota and walk up onto this table land in the jungle and try and find these packages. Is that what it is? That was roughly the plan, but it failed from the very start. They right. Could, they couldn't get anywhere near. The mountain was called Jane Table Mountain. Yep. They had to cross three rivers and they didn't have a dinghy with them. So the first time, in actual fact, a property cattle station manager up there threw them off his property uh, when he found them trying to cross the Normandy River. Not a good start. But they picked up from the locals that if you uh, were trying to get to Jane Table, the best way to do it was by boat, or you'd need a boat. So they cancelled the first trip to collect the heroin, arranged to uh, get access to a 10-foot aluminium dinghy, and then with a couple of chaps from Townsville who had local knowledge of the Princess Charlotte Bay, they went back with the boat and they got to Jane Table Mountain. By going and, up river and then walking. Yes, that's exactly. And did they run against some local barramundi poacher or something? That's right. They, uh, when they first went to Jane Table, they went up there at night, up the, up the uh, Normanby River, searched couldn't find the heroin milligan decided to call the second trip off and as he was returning back down the nombri river he spotted now it was daytime he spotted the camp of an illegal barramundi fisherman beside the river and they thought this guy might have already found these parcels we've got a front him and they did and he was shocked to see them at first. He thought they might be fishery officers giving him a hard time. But there were five of them and they were in a 10-foot aluminium dinghy and he thought the government could probably afford a better boat than that. So, uh, so he started so they, to outthink out them then. So they asked him, could he help look for them? Uh, look for two parcels. 
They told him that the parcels contained jewellery, not drugs, and they offered him, I think it was $2,500 for each parcel that he found and handed over to them unopened. Which, pretty good money in that era, the two parcels together would be $5,000, and that was a year's salary for a lot of people then, wasn't it? You bet. Yeah, so he eagerly said, I'll help. They went back up to the mountain with him. The Barramundi fisherman, David Ward, started looking again, and Ward found a parcel. Yeah. But he didn't tell anyone. Okay, he found one but didn't tell anybody. Yeah. Right. He was no fool. If it was 2500 unopened, it's got to be worth more. Yep. So he kicked it under a bush, pretended to keep looking, Milligan then found the second parcel. Okay. And keep searching for a couple of days looking for the parcel that Ward had found but not mentioned. Didn't find it, of course. And then they decided to return to Brisbane with the one parcel that they'd found. It just amazed me as we investigated this crime. They used their own names in everything that they did. Milligan handed Ward a piece of paper and said, if you find that second parcel, ring me. And that piece of paper had John Milligan and Milligan's telephone number on it. Oh, my God. How good. You couldn't believe it. And we'll be back after this. At what stage do you get to know all these things? We're telling this story in retrospect, but obviously when it was happening, you didn't know it was happening. I didn't. I wasn't even in the Brisbane office. I was stationed in the Sydney office of the Narcotics Bureau. So I didn't know of any of this. Ward takes his parcel of heroin to Cairns. Yeah. And he meets a shonky trawler operator at a waterfront pub, the guy who'd built a couple of trawlers which mysteriously burnt to the water lines for insurance payouts. That was a bit of good luck. (laughs) And Ward says, to, this guy's name was Peter Monaghan. Ward says to Monaghan, I've got drugs. Ward had opened the parcel and seen that it was white powder. And he says, look, I've got drugs to sell. Would you know anyone who would be interested in buying it? It's got to be worth more than $2,500. And Monaghan says, well, look, give me a sample. I've got a few contacts and I'll see if I can find someone who's interested. Now, these guys haven't got a clue what a sample of heroin normally amounts to. It amounts to a few grains on a piece of silver paper. Instead, Ward gets out his box of redhead matches, tips the matches out and scoops it full of heroin. No, no, it's enough to buy a car. Exactly. He gives that to Monaghan and Monaghan says, OK, I'll go looking for a buyer. There's no wonder amongst thieves with these guys. Monaghan thinks, hey, I'm not going to go to much trouble with this. Monaghan knew that at the time, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics had a policy of paying rewards for information that led to arrests or, in particular, uh, convictions. Oh, he could see an easy, quick kill, did he? The, the Monaghan. Exactly. Yeah. He takes his sample of heroin straight into Customs House in yep. Cairns and says to the collector of customs, I think this is drugs. I know where it came from. I'm ready for my reward. <laughs> and what happened to that? Well, the, the process takes time. Uh, the sub collector of customs sends the heroin uh, securely to the narcotics office in Brisbane. They test it. And they get the shock of their lives. This is high quality heroin. So they then send someone up to uh, interview Monaghan and see what extra information they could find out about where this came from. The wheels are turning slowly. Monaghan gets impatient that he hasn't received his reward yet. Of course, naturally, no one's been arrested as yet. And the court process can take years. So to speed things along, Monaghan sends a letter to the Attorney General, Federal Attorney General. Where's my money, he says. Where's my money? And and saying, look, drug importations are taking place in North Queensland. I've proved it. I've given you a sample of the drugs. Where's my money? 
And that virtually started the Operation Jungle investigation. That's when you... Well, the investigation, I hate to say it, ran off the rails to start with, and I wasn't involved as of yet. Another investigator from the Brisbane office flew back to Cairns, fronted David Ward, and said, where's the rest of this? You gave a sample to Monaghan. Where's the rest of the heroin? They got on the customs launch, went up to Ward's Barramundi camp, and Ward handed over a quantity of heroin. Whether it was the full package that he had, we'll never know, because Ward virtually called the shots. He even told this investigator, look, I'll go and get the heroin for you, but I won't do it unless I get an indemnity to the fact that uh, I won't be charged with anything. And this investigator wrote out an indemnity uh, on a piece of paper, signed it and handed it. He had no authority to do that. It wasn't something the Narcotics Bureau did. But when he, it, when he came back to Brisbane with the quantity of heroin that Ward had given him, he had compromised the investigation. Nothing happened. The heroin sat in the safe in Brisbane. And it's your view that Ward had split the, probably, probably split the package and, and given the bloke half or less of what was there and kept the rest, maybe. That's correct. I believe so. Um, I eventually was transferred to the Brisbane office of the Narcotics Bureau. Um, one of my duties was to approve the destruction of drugs for which no owner could be found and to and to approve the files being marked no further action. This file, at that stage it wasn't called Operation Jungle, but this file about the North Queensland seizure landed on my desk with a recommendation that it be written off. And I went through the file and I thought, nothing much has been done about this. This is a large seizure of heroin. And um, so I went into the boss and asked him, would he have any objection if I took it on? He said, if you want to do it, you get in touch with Canberra and get the approval from them, which I did. And that's when they said, OK, we'll call it Operation Jungle. Um, and I asked for the investigation to be run under my terms. And what that meant, we normally didn't do investigations like this. I said, I want to work on it exclusively to all other investigations. Because it was a cold case coming up for two years. It wouldn't be easy, I assume. You get your own office, sort of watertight. Do you get two colleagues of your choosing? Two officers of my choosing. Their names are Noel Caswell, who was a senior investigator, and John Moller. And it starts out pretty good. Yeah, it's the three of us. Good. Um, yep. Well, the biggest thing we had, we had this slip of paper. It was a walk-up start with John Milligan's name and phone number on. So what happened next? Where did you... Then it boils down to just good old-fashioned shoe leather investigation. We knew that they they were active in the Cairns area, so let's check for vehicle bookings, hotel accommodation. Oh right. And yeah, and that we not only came up with Milligan's name, which I, as I said, Andrew, it's astounded me that they were using their own names. So you had a correct name, a phone number, and then you find bookings in that name in the right area. Yep. We then went to Townsville and did the same thing, and we came up with accommodation and hire car bookings there. Magnificent. Uh, the reason that they Townsville became involved is that is where they borrowed the dinghy, which finally took them to Jane Taylor. So, yeah, it just became a good old-fashioned paperwork investigation. And so, you, long story short, you get to what point when? Well, it was around about, I think it was the, on the 10th of September, 1979, Noel Caswell and I flew to Sydney uh, to arrest Milligan. We believe that we had enough evidence. I should mention this. This is very important. One of the items of evidence that we came up with whilst we were investigating this offence were 17 phone calls made from Milligan's unit to a number, the number was OBOB25, a, a rural, it was before they had subscriber trunk dialing. A rural telephone number in just outside Brisbane. That's correct. 
near Nambour. When we checked out who OBOB25 was, <laughs> guess what? Glenn Patrick Hallahan. And just for those uh, listeners who A, aren't Queenslanders and B, are uh, younger than 45, who was that? Glenn Patrick Hallahan was Queensland's former ace detective. And he a very senior policeman by this stage? Detective sergeant. He left the police. But he was, uh, rather than his rank, he was senior in a more important way. He was the enforcer for the trio of Queensland policemen known as the Rat Pack. And the Rat Pack composed Terry Lewis, the police commissioner, Tony Murphy, superintendent in charge of the criminal investigation branch, and Glenn Hallahan. Those three. They were the three bent coppers. Of the three Rat Pack members, it wasn't Lewis who was the boss. He was the the least important. Yeah. Of the, Tony Murphy was the boss of the Rat Pack. He was the brains. Glenn Hallahan was the enforcer. And Lewis, well, being police commissioner, he was he, he was useful them. for the other two. He was certainly useful to have as a member of the team. And these people, their police minister at that stage would be one Russell Hinds. Is that right? Yes, minister for everything. That's him. And Russell Hinds, of course, is at the right hand of the premier, Bjorki Peterson. Yes. And so these three crooked coppers, including your man Hallahan, the enforcer, basically operating under the patronage of a willfully blind premier who let them get away with murder. Is that right? Untouchable, yes. And, Andrew, it's not just a phrase, get away with murder. Hallahan was associated with three murders. So you're dealing with the, the nasty people. So when you dig up this phone number, uh, OBOB25, suddenly you realise you're in with the big kids. So we looked at the dates that Milligan had made these 17 phone calls to Hallahan, and they, they matched with before a heroin courier would fly to Bangkok to purchase the heroin. I see. Before they flew to Cairns to get the aircraft to go to New Guinea to bring the heroin back. Uh, before each of the aborted trips to Jane Table Mountain. All along the way, whenever anything important happened, there would be a phone call either before or after the event to Hallahan. You saw that pattern and drew your own conclusions. You bet. Hallahan was involved. This was confirmed after we arrested Milligan. So anyway, on the 10th of September, Noel Caswell and I, we've got enough to warrant Milligan's arrest. But I didn't know where he was where he was living, he'd moved. He was living in a block of units in Oxlade Avenue, New Farm in Brisbane. He had moved from there. I didn't really want to know where he was because I didn't want him to know we were after him. Uh, I had a belief that he had false passports and I thought if he gets wind that the Narcotics Bureau is after him, he's gone. So um, when we were ready to arrest him, I let the word be known amongst trusted police officers that I was trying to find him. And I got a phone call from a friend in the New South Wales drug squad who gave me an address and said, I think you'll find Milligan there. We flew to Sydney, went to the unit, nice looking unit, I think it was on about the 12th floor of a block of units overlooking the harbour at Edgecliff, knocked on the door, and that was the first time I'd ever met John Milligan. What was he like? Cool as a cucumber. The jigsaw pieces start falling into place in retrospect. Uh, he was not concerned at all. Uh, here were two guys from the Narcotics Bureau knocking on your door wanting to search your apartment. Yeah, go ahead. He didn't want to speak to a solicitor. Or he didn't even ask what it was about. The apartment was clean. Nothing in there. No documents, nothing. So we took him down to Circular Key, to the Narcotics Bureau office at Circular Key. I cautioned him and told him that he was about to be arrested for the importation of a quantity of heroin into North Queensland. And he protested and said uh, that he knew nothing about it. He refused to be interviewed on the subject. And 
a little later in the evening, I said, okay, we're going to take you to Phillips Street Police Station where we'll lock you up for the night. That was the closest police station to Customs House at Circular Quay. We use the police cells there to lodge prisoners. And he, he said, what about bail? And I said, if you're going to get bail, I want to hold your passport. And he said, I've lost it. I've lost my passport. I, I know I destroyed it. That's right. I spilled ink on it. Who uses ink in this day and age? But fair enough. He claimed he didn't have a passport. So I locked him up at Phillip Street. John's sister lived at North Sydney. Yeah. You knock on her door. I knock on her door. And the funny thing was that um, Noel and I, when we got word as to where Milligan was living, that morning in Brisbane, we'd been out on surveillance. We looked like a couple of darrows, pardon me. You know, we, we weren't in suits or anything. And I knocked on this poor woman's door at about midnight, looking like, I don't know what. Yeah. And she opened the door. And so I had my idea. I introduced myself and I told her, regrettably, her brother had just been arrested and had been lodged at Phillips Street Police Station, that he would be appearing at the Phillips Street Special Federal Court the following morning. And the question of bail would come up. If he was to be bailed, he would need to surrender his passport. And his sister looked at me and said, well, do you want to take it now? So she... <laughs> sometimes you lose, sometimes you win, Andrew. So she goes and grabs it and hands it over. His she real passport his in passport. his real name. Yep. So next morning when he's in court, he's desperate to get bail for two reasons. One, he had these police who were going to look after him, he believed, and he had a false passport. And um, I knew of the false passport in actual fact. I'd arrested one of his other couriers on a separate heroin No No honour among thieves again. That's it. And the guy had told me he had a passport in the name of Markenstein. Yeah, I didn't let Milligan know that I knew this. Anyway... We're sitting in court, the, the magistrate's court, it's merely a bail hearing. And the magistrate says, will the prisoner please stand? And the police officer assisting the magistrate comes over to me, gives me a shove and says, get up. <laughs> he thought you were the prisoner. Because I was looking like a scruff, he thought I was. And Milligan <laughs> looked like your arrested. lawyer because Milligan looked quite cool and calm and collected uh, and was he was well dressed. Always beautifully dressed. Oh, that's gorgeous. So I looked at the copper and said, he's the prisoner, I'm the arresting officer. <laughs> so Milligan gets up and uh, the magistrate asks him where his passport is. He said, uh, sir, I've spilt ink on it and it's been destroyed. I threw it away some months ago. Magistrate says, okay. I stand up, hold up his passport and say, sir, here's his passport. His sister had it. Bail refused. Bail refused because he'd told porkies. That's it. And that was the big thing that Milligan was waiting for, bail, because he's never going to see me again. And this whole story hinges on that one thing. If you hadn't gone and got that passport, he gets bail with the false one, I imagine. You'd put a stopper on the real one and you wouldn't see him again. He'd be up there in some Asian territory where there's no easy access to him uh, living the life of Riley. And that would be that. Uh, we wouldn't be here today. So that's when his life changed too. That The moment the magistrate said, bail refused. I'd been up all night, as, uh, as I said, I'd flown down the previous day. I'd virtually been awake all night. I was feeling like death warmed up. He refused to speak to me the evening I arrested him, the previous evening. So Noel Caswell and I just wanted to get back to Brisbane and start uh, putting the brief of evidence together. Um, outside the court, they were about to take John Milligan to Long Bay Jail to lock him up until his next court appearance, with bail having been refused. He grabbed my arm and said, can I speak to you? And I, I was cheesed off. I said, John, you had your chance last night. You know, I'm, I'll see you at your next appearance. And he said, you don't know how big this is. He was desperate. I need to speak to you. And I could sense that something had changed. And um, so I asked the officers who were about to escort him to Long Bay Jail if I could 
have a word with him. They, they didn't mind. We went into a, just he and I into a room adjoining the court, an interview room. And he put me down a bit. He said, you're just a boy. I was younger than him, four years younger than him. And I was pretty fresh faced. And he says, you're just a boy. You don't know how big this is. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, the people who are above me, I call them the triumvirate. And I said, who are you talking about? I've never heard the term, the triumvirate. He said, I report to Glenn Hallahan. He reports to Tony Murphy and he reports to Terry Lewis. It was a rat pack. That's the moment when you realised that you had a tiger by the tail. Yep. He said, if I go to Long Bay Jail, I'll kill me because I know too much. He said, you've got to put me in some protective custody. And here he goes again, name dropping. He said, ring Harvey Bates. That was the director of the Narcotics Bureau in Canberra. He said, ring Harvey Bates. The big boss. My boss. Yep. And tell him that I'm prepared to help you. And I thought, well, I'm not going to ring Bates and go guarantor for John Milligan unless I honestly in my heart believe that he's telling the truth. So I looked John in the eye and I said, where's the Markenstein passport? And I knew that he wouldn't give that up unless it was serious. I see. That's, that's his it, false passport that was his get out of the country card. You bet. And he said, it's in a room in Paddington. And he gave me the address of the room. He gave me a note for Graham Bridge, his accomplice, and told me where to find Bridge if I couldn't find the key to the room at Paddington, which was supposed to be on a, a door sill. And from that moment, Andrew, we knew he'd given up everything. When I went to that room later that day, there are a number of passport applications, all of them in different names with Milligan's photograph on them. He, d- he was onto that trick that crooks used in that era of going around looking for babies their own age, born around the time they were, that had died in infancy, yeah. getting their details from gravestones or death notices and applying in those names. That's it. Near genius like you, he knew how to play the game. Yeah, it was possible pre-computer pre-digital data, you could do those things. Yep. We found bank transfers of money in the thousands to Glenn Patrick Callahan, diary notes mentioning Tony Murphy. Um, You know, he wouldn't have given this up. Uh, It was an Aladdin's mine, you know. Of rich evidence against basically a corrupt police system in Queensland. Yep, that room was full of corroboration for the crimes that he had committed and the police who were assisting him. And we'll be back after this to finish our story. At this point, what happens next, I think, is a whole new story of of what happened once you were in receipt of this fairly terrible knowledge that you were going to be up against this triumvirate of senior corrupt police and and politicians, really. John... We'd love to hear more about this story next week because there's plenty more to tell. Thank you, Andrew. It'll be a pleasure to continue the story. Thanks for listening. Life and Crimes is a Sunday Herald Sun production for True Crime Australia. Our producer is John Burton. If you like the show, leave a five-star rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to know more about these stories, links are in the description of this episode.